France and New Zealand this weekend, folks. It's the late game on uh, on Saturday, but it's a nice nine o'clock, I think, kickoff for us here in New Zealand. Uh, rank six against rank two in the world. This one's been built up for quite some time, and especially because it is almost like a mini preview of one of the pool games that we will see at the Rugby World Cup in a couple of years' time. So there is a lot of excitement building about this one. We'll go through the squad, some of the recent history, uh, the stats, predictions, and you guys can let me know your thoughts. In terms of their autumn campaigns, I don't think the fans of either side will be totally satisfied. Obviously, uh, New Zealand blew a kind of understrength Welsh Welsh side across off, off the park uh, three weeks ago. Uh, 54 16 and then kind of a much changed side struggled a wee bit uh, against Italy I mean 47 9 still pretty comfortable but they beat Italy by less than what they beat Wales which is unusual uh, in the scheme of things and then a, uh, a lost 29 20 against Ireland which could have been worse was maybe uh, maybe a, a much needed wake up call for the All Blacks and their coaching staff um, but either way it was uh, it was a loss that could have been even more uh, for France, they've had two victories, 29-20 over uh, Argentina and then 41-15 over Georgia. I kind of likened the win over Georgia to New Zealand's win over Italy and that it wasn't kind of all that convincing even if the scoreboard looks, you know, looks pretty enough. Um, France have been kind of trying some new combos, uh, so maybe that's part of the reason, but they've settled things down a bit for this game. But um, yeah, we'll kind of see how things go. Remember, France are on a six-day turnaround because they played... Uh, on the Sunday, whereas New Zealand played on the Saturday. So in theory, uh, the French guys may be having tired legs slightly towards the final 10 minutes, but we will kind of have to wait and see if that has any effect. Uh, the front row is by Malvaca and Antonio. That's the same front row as last week, except for the fact that Malvaca has to start. He scored a couple of tries last week against the Georgians. Um, but yeah, uh, Marchand is the main guy and he's out with a rib injury. So it's kind of unfortunate news. Uh, for France, but Molvaca is no slouch, so he's uh, definitely a good replacement. Woki and Willemsa are the locking duo. Now, Woki, from my experience of watching him, is generally a Lucy, but he played lock last week and did a pretty solid job. Very good uh, guy in the air, although he wasn't the main guy winning the aerial ball last week. He certainly runs the French line out, and uh, Willemsa is a big, solid unit of a man. So, um, yeah, there's a bit of size and skill between the two of those guys. Uh, Kurs, Jalon, and Aldrit are the back row, very high skilled and high work rate back row. I would expect to see uh, Aldrit maybe crashing onto some balls if they try some of their set plays because France uh, have quite a few of those. And um, yeah, Jalon, if you saw him play against Australia, you'd be pretty familiar with him uh, from the tour in kind of, was it July? So um, yeah, as a, a bit of experience in the back row, although not kind of in a hundred cap experience, but in recent times under Galtier experience. Uh, Dupont and Insamark is that 19 combo that we're more f used to seeing instead of necessarily Dupont and um, Jalibert, which we've seen in the last few weeks. But Insamark is back to 10. They've played him at 12 the last couple of weeks. And he still kind of looked like a 10 playing 12, which maybe makes sense. But um, yeah, it's, it's a more of a familiar look with the, the, the normal combo. Uh, this week and the fact that we get to see Dupont up against Aaron Smith is going to be worth the price of admission on its own two of the guys kind of rated as the um, you know the two best halfbacks in the world there are others but certainly both these guys are very good uh, the midfield is Dante and Fiku uh, Dante is another guy who was a big big unit so the All Blacks midfielders will need to be mindful of that guy running some crash ball at them and uh, Fiku is a kind of multi-skilled guy at least from what I've seen of him who, like last week, he was crashing up against the Georgians, and then suddenly he just unleashes a try-scoring uh, pass to set it up, rather than kind of going himself. So he's very versatile. Uh, Pinot scored a couple last week as well. Uh, powerful right winger. And then uh, Villiers is more of like the, the sevens guy, the elusive runner on the left wing. So I kind of like that power, and um, like a big man, little man thing. Even though like um, Pinot's not a giant man, he's, he's very powerful, so yeah, I kind of like that combo, and then uh, Jamine with that reliable boot of his, and running game there, at fullback, the bench, Barlow comes in to replace uh, the reserve hooker jersey, Gross Bamba are the rock prop replacements, Tofu Fanua drops to the bench, he's another big man, uh, Flamont, who's only had two caps now, uh, is the um, the lock replacement alongside Tafel so it's two locks, and then Creton is another loose forward replacement, so Luku and Jalibert, the two back replacements, so it's a 6-2 split for the French, 
um, maybe thinking a bit of a battle up front, but we will have to see. Uh, for New Zealand, they've been changing the lineups regularly, maybe too regularly for some people's liking, but it's another kind of much changed lineup. Although one area they've kept it the same as the props, Moody and Laulala, I think are clearly Fozzie's preferred loose, uh, loose head and tight head combo. Uh, Coles though gets the start uh, at hooker ahead of Cody Taylor. Um, I think Taylor took a bit of a knock in the last game. I'm not sure if he's out uh, injured or just rotated, but either way, uh, it is Coles this week, so experienced guy. Uh, you don't get much more experience than Retallick and Whitelock in the locks. Um, although I was talking them up last week and New Zealand didn't do a heck of a lot, so maybe I won't talk them up too much this week. But Whitelock is captain, despite the fact that Sam Kane is back. Sam Kane's back at seven. Remember, he's had a long injury layoff. The All Blacks have kind of eased him into it. And uh, he's got big shoes to fill, man, because Papa Lee got through about 28 tackles last week. I know Kane is defensively one of the most uh, apt players at play seven. Like, he's got a huge work rate as well. But there's certainly pressure on him because New Zealand's got other good open side flankers. Akira Iwane will need to get some go-forward ball from six. He's up from the bench, and Adi Fasavi is still there at eight. Aaron Smith, as I mentioned, is back at nine. Remember, he traveled after the All Blacks had... Seemingly a little bit of worries at um, at nine with injuries, but uh, yeah, um, TJ's dropped. He's out of the 23, and uh, Brad Weber is back into the squad to um, sit on the replacements bench. Moonga is at 10. I didn't read that Bodie was officially out because I've had no internet for half the day, but I did remember he was doubtful going into this one, so I'm assuming because he's not in the squad that doubtful ended up being... Uh, just not available. Uh, Tupaya gets a crack at 12. That's going to be a massive one. He was up against Dante. But Tupai is a big carrier of his own, so that's going to be a, an interesting battle of two guys who are still kind of early on in their international careers. Rico Iwane is at 13. Will Jordan's at uh, right wing, and uh, George Bridge is at left wing. George Bridge is like, yeah, every team's got that guy who people like to give stick, like that bird just flying over my house. Um, George Bridge is that guy for New Zealand fans, uh, alongside others, but George Bridge is the guy that everyone likes to give stick, so... Uh, he could certainly use a good game. If Penno gives him a big sit-down, don't argue, then um, yeah, he's going to be copping it from all Blacks fans. Uh, Jordy Barrett's there at fullback, so he is um, he's a pretty secure guy to have at the back. Um, but yeah, he's still got Damien McKenzie on the bench, or Damien um, against Italy didn't look all that flash. I feel like Jordy's spot at the back is, is uh, pretty secure at this point. Uh, other replacements, Tokiaho, Bawa, and um, Tuunga Fasi, the front row replacement. So that's a bit of power, I would say. Vai is still the lock replacement. Frizzell uh, is the loose forward. And three backs in Weber, McKenzie, and Havili is still there riding the pine. Um, France haven't beaten New Zealand for a while. I think 2009 is the last time they've beaten New Zealand, which seems like a lifetime ago. If that is correct, I could be wrong, but I think when I looked it up, it was 2009. Um, but either way, it should be a pretty entertaining game. Like when you look at the stats across this year, these are like two of the most offloading teams that you will find if you if you enjoy a good offload. Like most teams average around kind of four or five offloads a game. Scotland like to chuck it around there like at seven. France are at nine and New Zealand are at 11 offloads a game. So, yeah, both sides like to chuck the ball around a bit, which could be, um, yeah, which could be really fun to watch. Uh, New Zealand averaged, interestingly, like 10 clean breaks a game in the Rugby Championship, but it's been six on this tour of these three games. Even Italy kind of kept New Zealand pretty quiet in terms of making clean breaks. So are these guys getting a bit tired? Is it just the coaching has been worked out by keen opposition coaches who are observing? Uh, is it the chopping and changing of the combos? I don't know, but we'll have to see if they're able to kind of unlock the uh, the French defense. Um, over the last couple of games, France have really controlled the possession and territory against uh, Georgia and Argentina. But interestingly, those are kind of two teams that France would go into that one expecting to be the dominant team, especially at home. Whereas when they played a lot of their other kind of tier one teams or six nations teams, they were quite kind of happy to live without the ball. But the All Blacks are also quite happy to live without the ball. The All Blacks get more turnovers than pretty much anyone else and then hit teams on the counter. But uh, France, like in their series against Australia, are very happy to live without the ball. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see which which way that goes. Um, yeah, I mean, New Zealand lived without the ball last week, but that wasn't by choice because Ireland were just too dominant. But 
yeah, different different prospect this week against France. Um, average score across those last five games, for what it's worth, is 38-15. And uh, maybe that kind of leads into some of the predictions. The rugby forecast algorithm says New Zealand by 15 points. Uh, the bookies say New Zealand by five. So maybe a little bit more cautious after last week's game against Ireland where New Zealand went in as favourites and kind of got pretty well beaten. But yeah, like I said, both sides will be looking to improve after some less than satisfying performances maybe in the last couple of weeks for both but um yeah there's only one loss on the board so it's not all doom and gloom by any means but yeah we'll see how things go you guys let me know what your thoughts who do you reckon's got this one do you think france at home can uh, break their drought against new zealand or do you think new zealand who don't often lose two in a row will bounce back with a good win you guys let me know your thoughts and i'll talk to you again soon see you later